Fox Valley Voice. Hi, Quenby. Hi, Jaime. <laughs> How are you? Good. I, I'm Good. very happy to see you back in the studio. W what are you doing here? Well, thanks to you and thanks to our successful and fun podcast that we had a couple months ago, mm -hmm. we're back here and we've kind of started a new creative venture together, I would say, right? You, you, you want to do your own show. You asked me to do my own show. <laughs> Well, you have <laughs> so, a lot of things that you want to talk about. Yes. Yeah. So I I asked you to consider mm -hmm. doing your own show. Yes. And you said, sure. I did. Um, so why don't you tell us what this show is going to be? So after you, after we talked about starting my own show, um, I really thought about um, healing and community and how they go hand in hand. So we, so I decided to call it uh, the Siren Sound Cafe. So tell me about that um, real quick, because we haven't talked about it yet. I like the name. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean for you, the Siren Sound? So I, I am obviously... You're part mermaid. I am part mermaid, <laughs> if listeners could see my fins. No, um, I'm obsessed with mermaids. So um, it only fit, you know, it was only right that we paid mm -hmm. tribute to them. Um, but also that oh, somebody here. Yeah. <laughs> um, just also that it's kind of like the call out to people and, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, a call, an echo, a call in an echo kind of thing where um, just getting the voice out into the community and the guests that we uh, plan on hosting are kind of like the echo, the people um, in the community that are doing positive things to help people to heal uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Mm. So um, that's kind of how I came up with the name. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. exactly it. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea for you to um, want to, to share these thoughts and feelings about health and healing and, you know, not that we're all the most healthy people, but, um, we can at least talk about how to get there. Right. Yeah. And I don't, um, I don't really see like that word healing has a, has a bigger connotation for me in the fact that, um, our life experiences and our difficulties and we've heard this over and over again, they really are what shapes us, but who we reach out to and how we reach out and how we uh, meet adversity and how we embrace our scars. Um, I think that as we heal, we become new people. We regenerate, right? Mm -hmm. So um, who I am today is because of many of the people that are going to be interviewed on this show. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so real quick, why don't you tell us a little bit about who we're going to talk to here on your on your first episode? So the first guest, her name is Stephanie Krantz, and she is the perinatal education coordinator with uh, Northwestern Hospital. And the reason why I chose her was because my own journey towards personal wellness, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, um, really began with her. And after the birth of my daughter, uh, somehow, through fate, through luck, we were connected, and um, she really started me on my own personal um, path of healing and and self awareness and wellness. So, mm. I thought if we are going to start anywhere, we start at the beginning, and she was definitely a pivotal person in my own personal journey towards healing. So, mm. so we picked her. Well, I'm excited. Let's talk to Stephanie. Me too. Welcome to the Siren Sound Cafe. My name is Quen B. Schuyler. I'll be your host for this session. And um, the purpose of the Siren Sound Cafe really is to uh, bring light into all kinds of methods of healing and uh, community and how community and healing go hand in hand and how in order to um, 
promote healing, we need to reach out and we need to connect to other people. So uh, welcome. And my first guest today is Stephanie Krantz. Welcome. Hi, Quimby. Stephanie, would you mind just telling us uh, your job title and what you do for the community? Um, I have been an OB nurse for 32 years, and um, currently I am the perinatal education coordinator at Central DuPage Hospital and Delnor Hospital. And so um, my job covers the prenatal classes and the postnatal support groups and exercise programs. Awesome. So how Stephanie and I came together was after the birth of my daughter. Um, actually, we met before that, correct? Mm -hmm. My After the birth of my son uh, 10 years ago, I suffered with sepsis. And so upon um, being pregnant with my daughter, I was very nervous about delivery and very nervous about C-section. And so somehow we got connected through somebody at, at Northwestern mm -hmm. and um, they connected us and I met with you and you actually took me on a tour of the OR room. I think that's how this started, right? Yes, it was. Um, you were going to be induced. No, you were having a C-section yes. the next day. So you and I um, got all dressed up and went into the OR. <laughs> so you could feel the temperature of the room. Feel It's always kind of a cold room. And the smell, you know, is a little more sterile. And I wanted yeah. you to be able to feel that so you were comfortable the next day when you come in. That nothing was a surprise as far as the atmosphere went. So yeah. you could just concentrate on just... Getting the baby out. And I remember we had to put on all the the uniforms and I'm nine months pregnant and Dave telling me that I look like a Teletubby because <laughs> it was, it was so pretty giant. tight. <laughs> yeah, it was very tight. There's a picture of that that ho I hope never gets out. Um, so we met and we toured and I think that's the first time we connected. Um, I didn't know really the um, kind of the scope of what you do until after Khaleesi, my, my daughter, was born. Um, and I guess what I really, how I really want to introduce Stephanie is that um, she leads postpartum uh, uh, connection, which is uh, mothers that are going through uh, postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. Um, it's a community group. It's a free group where we can get together and um, it's discreet and we can bring our babies with us, which is always awesome, and kind of connect and talk to each other about what we're experiencing um, as new mothers and, 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 the, and the issues that are coming up. Um, and it, it, for me, um, after my daughter was born, I remember the postpartum nurses coming into the room. Like she was three days old and talking to me about signs of postpartum depression. And I remember pushing that away and being like, no, no, no. Postpartum depression isn't going to happen to me, mm -hmm. you know? And I was buying into a stigma. Um, and so I'd like to ask you, why do you think there is a stigma around postpartum depression? You know, when people hear the word, you know, it's, we, we have an umbrella word now, we call it perinatal mood disorders. And I think right there scares people away because now it's a disorder. Right. A disorder means something's broken, something's wrong. So I think that scares people away. So postpartum depression, you know, it means a lot of people take, um, take a lot of guilt, take self-blame for that. No one's to blame for postpartum depression. You know, there's so many factors around it. Um, I know my oldest is 26 and I suffered. I suffered with my first, my second, and my fourth. And my third, it just, it just didn't happen. And, um, and, and even then people didn't talk about it because it was just what happened. Like, oh, you know, you're sad. You just stay home. Um, <laughs> now I think it's great because people are coming out and people are finding a safe place to talk and to be real about what they're feeling. Um, but as far as the stigma goes, people still hesitate. You yeah. know, and that's why I say, you know what? I mean, postpartum depression, it is such, it's such a huge force with mothers. You know, 20% of first time moms do, um, do suffer from postpartum depression. 80% suffer from the baby blues, which is in that first couple of weeks when there's lots of tears and adjustments. It's after that when that continues and then daily life is interfering. You're not eating enough. You're not sleeping enough. You're sleeping too much. Right. You're eating too much, you know? So, um, and so I think people, Right now, especially being a new mom, I was very surprised. I was an OB nurse. I knew what was going on. I knew I was going to be awesome at this. And I set myself up for it because I was going to be awesome at something that I really didn't quite understand. So for me, not that I set myself up, but kind of a little bit, um, 
because I was going to get it. I was going to understand when she cried, what was the matter? I was always going to be able to fix any problem she had. Oh, so I was tired, but I was still going to be patient and all those things. It's just, it's just so hard to do by yourself. Yeah. And, um, so I think that's a big thing that people now do because we're kind of, um, we're kind of a linear family. You know, we don't have the extended family that stays with us anymore. Right. We leave the hospital, we go home with mom, dad, baby. Yeah. And so mom, dad, baby. And so that's, you know, three people. It's just it's just a little bit harder to go through when you don't have someone who's been there before with you doing it. Right. So, yeah. So I would I would say I know I pushed people away when they were trying to educate me. And then I remember um my first couple of doctors visits, I was struggling. Um and even the doctors were kind of saying, "Maybe you want to think about postpartum depression. Maybe you want to you know, talk to somebody about it. I, I was tearful in the doctor's office. And I think they give you a checklist now. Mm-hmm. And like, I didn't want to be honest on the checklist. Like, are you having tearful moments? Are you not sleeping? I wanted to be like, answer no, no, like extreme, like, yes, I'm feeling all these things. But I, there was still this stigma. Like, if I'm like this, does that mean that I'm a bad mom? Does that mean that they're going to like take the baby away? What does that mean? Right. And so, so we want to be super mom. Yeah. We don't want to admit we're doing this because we can handle it. Right. So um, I don't know how it happened, but I think one day I just decided to show up to your group. Mm -hmm. And it took me, I think, six weeks for me to finally be like, okay, I'm going. I need help. Um, I'm not, I don't look like super mom. I don't feel like super mom. And I remember showing up and that was the first time when we all sat down There were moms that looked like me. There were moms, you know, that um, we kind of all had the same look on our face. We were tired. We were struggling. We weren't dressed to the nines with our makeup on and our hair done perfectly. Um, And I remember feeling like I could breathe. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I'll let you go ahead and say your slogan, um, who the best mothers are. I, I have said this for so many years, I always say the best mamas I ever met were the mamas that walked through that door. Right. You know, the people that are brave enough to say, you know what, there's something out there. I don't know the person who facilitates it. They don't know me. I don't know my ladies that are in the room. And then they walk through that door with hope in their heart and hope in their mind. And I think that just says so much for someone who is struggling. Like at home, I struggle. But when I come out here, Mm -hmm. you know, because you and I kept in contact in the hospital. I remember calling you right after your surgery. Yeah. And you were doing well. And then, um, and then we kept in contact over the time. And I kept saying, Quinby, just come, come and connect. Do you remember me saying? Mm -hmm. I'm like, just come and connect with the ladies. You don't even have to say anything. Right. Just to sit in that room. And, um, and we all just sit on the floor. Um, all the babies are with us. And, um, some people come for a long time. Some people come till they go back to the work, but everyone's at a different part of their motherhood journey. And I always think that's such a big deal. So when you came in, you were pretty raw and some mom might have done that six months before. So she can identify the look on your face and look at you and nod. Yeah. See, it's going to get better. You know, this isn't going to be always, but it is today. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a hopeful thing. And that's why I love when people keep coming back when they're healing, um, part of their journey, you know, is at a different end is for mamas who come in that are raw and, that need someone to look at him and give him a hug and say, it does get better. I was where you are. And then you can look at him and say, gosh, you know what? I would never thought she'd be in a room for postpartum depression and anxiety. Yeah. Right. And I remember that. I remember that people telling me it's going to get better. And you told me it's going to get better. And I think um, a lot of us that go through it think we're always go- like, that's the biggest thing with postpartum and maybe just depression and anxiety in general, you think that where you're at now is going to be how you are going to be forever. Mm -hmm. And so to even when people were saying that, I didn't necessarily believe it. I thought, well, they can all get better, but there's something wrong with me. But I think in my journey, it was continuing to show up and continuing to get the help and to continue to kind of follow your advice. You were kind of a, a guide for me as far as how I navigated through my own uh, trauma and then my own issues with postpartum depression and anxiety. So I agree. Um, and the fact that it is hopeful to hear people say it's going to get better. And I think to the people that are listening that are maybe going through that and thinking, I'm different, I'm not going to get better. Just believe it, right? I, yeah, I've done this for 11 years and I've never, ever had one mom not not, not feel better. Um, 
And um, I have a volunteer that comes to the Wednesday group at CDH, and she was one of my ladies nine and seven years ago with her two kids. And um, she came in, and her, it was her second child, and he was about maybe about a year. And so she kind of pulled me aside, and she said, you know, Stephanie, I kind of feel like I'm just taking up space now. Like, I don't, I don't really have these struggles. She goes, I come because it's Wednesday and this is kind of what we do. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't. The words you have, people hear you. I said, so come because it's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Don't not come because you don't think you have anything to offer and you're taking up space. That day, one of my uh, ladies who'd been there for nine months, she said, and I did not, I didn't, I didn't um, egg her on. I didn't say anything. She said, you know what, Stephanie? And she looked at the group. She said, I've been coming for almost nine months and I've been out in the fog. And she goes, but I can hear you guys now. You guys are like, when you hear it, it's going to get better. She goes, I'm, I'm now closer to shore and you guys are the horns and I can hear you now. I can hear the fog horns. See, this is why, because we, every, we need somebody on the other side of the journey Mm -hmm. to have that. And, um, and I, I started to cry and I said, no, this, this is such a great place for anyone. And it helps people heal to help other people heal. Yeah. You know, it is a support group, meaning that you are there to accept support. And when you are able to, and when it fits, then you are there to maybe offer a word of kindness or offer yeah. to support. There's some days you come in and no, that's not even what's on the radar. And everybody can feel who needs more support that day. Yeah. You know, and I always say, we're never going to heal. We're never going to cure everything in one day. But you got to say it and people listen to you. And at two o'clock in the morning, if someone's awake and you post something on our Facebook page, there's someone there who's going to say something. And I think the ladies think about each other throughout the week. And I always think that's something. I'm like, if you show up and then the next week, someone will be like, hey, remember last week, this is what you were going to try to do. Did you ever get that done? Just accountability. Someone's listening. Mm -hmm. Someone's listening. And even I had one of my ladies, She's this is probably 10 years ago, and she came in every week and she had her postpartum story and PTSD, very similar Mm -hmm. um, to kind of your story. And it's very real. And especially when it's medically very real. And um, she would come in and talk about it each week. And one day she said, I don't even want to say it. I say the same thing every week. I'm like, I know. Yeah. And someday you won't. So (laughs) So one day she came and she goes, I'm done. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I think I'm done. You know, it was yeah. kind of like, it was, it was just, for her, because that was healing. Mm-hmm. And I said, you can't talk about it every week. And we like to hear it every week because yeah. we know that was part of her healing and that she allowed us to be part of her journey. And I, I just, I just think that's amazing. The power of people and the connection people can have together. I really do. Well, I, agree. I believe in it every day. I know that. So kind of what happens with uh, Stephanie's groups is that, or with your groups is, So the groups meet at the hospital in kind of a community room. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, you can bring the children. And then you also get hooked up with a private Facebook group that no one else can see what you're posting except the members in the group. And so for me, on the days where I was struggling, you know, with a baby in your arms and anxiety and thoughts ruminating, why am I like this? Why am I not like the other moms, why am I not like the celebrity moms who can pop five babies out and be fine? Um, you know, I would put a post up in that group and say, I need help. I'm not feeling well. Right. Mm-hmm. And there would be a huge response, not only on the page from women that I had been in the group with, but women that had moved forward and that don't even post in the group but said, you're going to get better. You're going, you know, hang Mm -hmm. in there. And then also my phone would start dinging with private messages. How are you doing? What can I do? Mm -hmm. Do you need me to bring you some food? Do you need me to take the baby? I mean, the whole community aspect of this is huge and paramount. And I think it needs to happen, not with just with new moms, but I think with just people in general, we need to know when we're supposed to, when, when to ask for help and to not be ashamed to ask for help. So I agree with you on everything that you just said. And I kind of want to go back, um, maybe a little bit more of an education piece, if you could. What do you think kind of causes postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety? Like how much of it do you think is hormonal? How much of it do you think is kind of situational? Is it a blend of the two? What are your thoughts? You know, it's kind of everything. There's no one cause for it and there's no group that that escapes it. Um, I think, you know, I mean, it's kind of a combination. I think um, anybody with infertility, because that's going to be a problematic, um, anyone with a traumatic pregnancy, 
um, any with the traumatic birth, um, bed rest. So now we've got things prenatally that set yourself up for it already. And then, um, and then I think one of the biggest things are, is our expectations of how we are going to be as, as a new parent. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I mean, like I said, I was going to know why my baby cried and be able to stop the baby dogs bark and babies cry. That's what happens. (laughs) But I was going to be able to stop it because I was going to know exactly what to do. And, I was just, you know, breastfeeding was going to go so great. Mm-hmm. And it didn't for me. I am a lactation consultant now, but I struggled with all four of my kids. Um, and so for me, it was just that realization that I have no idea what to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the middle of the night when you're walking and you've gotten two and a half hours sleep over 24 hours, you don't think clearly. <laughs> right. Who and does? so it just starts to wear down. And then, you know, you look at someone during the day and they're like, well, I told you you were going to be tired because you had a baby. It doesn't, that kind of advice doesn't help. You know, right. the story is like, well, you're never going to sleep again. I mean, it's just, I don't know. The first time I realized I had it, my daughter, oldest daughter, well, she was about a week old and um, I was really obsessed with her sleeping. I had flashlights everywhere and <laughs> I just, I just would like check her face all the time. <laughs> and um, I went to the, I went to the grocery store and I had my heart, I hadn't grocery shopped in a week. And I pushed it and I had half of it onto the conveyor belt. And I looked at the guy. I'm like, I have to go. Yeah. I have to go right now. Mm -hmm. And the person's like, I'm like, I have to leave. Mm -hmm. I have to go. I walked out, drove home. So my husband's like, hey, um, where are the groceries? I'm like, "Mm, at the store. (laughs) He's like, did you buy them? I'm like, no, no. They're probably in the cooler somewhere. I had to leave. I just had a, I don't even know if it's a panic attack. I just, I didn't know who I was anymore. And that was really surprising Mm -hmm. because my baby wasn't with me. So I just wasn't, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't happy with who I was at home because I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I'd watch the clock and wait for noon. And then I'd watch the clock and wait for five. And I really was doing a nice job, but I didn't know it because you just have this baby that cries a lot and goes to the bathroom on you and no one ever, you know, they don't say, Hey mom, great job. You did awesome today. You know, right. Three weeks later, it's the same thing. Yep. So, um, so for me, I was just very surprised that I, I didn't rock it like I thought I was going to. So I, I set myself up. Yeah. I mean, truly, and I didn't have any family here. Um, but you know, a history, one of the biggest predisposing factors is a history of anxiety or depression, which I didn't have any mm-hmm. and I crashed hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I can totally relate. I think, I think it's interesting because if there are people out there listening, I think a lot of people can, can relate to that. So here's the thing. I think that happens to more people than we think. I don't, I remember gripping a grocery cart so hard to get through a store with this just flooded feeling of anxiety and fear and failure. I remember leaving several (laughs) carts full um and i just think so many people are suffering in silence i think so many people have that and they do those kinds of things and they never talk about it and so for those people that are in that place um what kind of advice would you offer you know it's funny cuz when you say that it reminds me with um I think it was my first daughter and um, we had the stork outside and I was on the floor in the living room and I just, just kind of fell to my knees and was crying because I just, I didn't know how to be. I didn't know what to do next because I wasn't feeling it. You know, I was caring for this child who was mine and I was taking good care of her because I would take care of any child that way, but I didn't feel like I was doing it because she was mine. It was because she was in my care and that was very sad for me. Mm-hmm. Someone, I wanted a baby so bad and I saw people walking um, by my house and there was two women pushing a stroller and they were smiling and laughing. And I thought they can see my stork. They know that I'm miserable here. I I was, no, I did. I got paranoid. I'm like, they know I'm miserable and they're laughing. And I knew they weren't laughing at me, but I'm like, they're not looking at my house and feeling sorry. And I think they should Mm -hmm. because they see my stork and they know my baby's, you know, a couple days old. And you want them to come to the door and say, how are you doing? I just wanted someone to look at the house and go, oh gosh, she's probably struggling in there, but it didn't happen. And, and, um, but part of it, that is, I mean, I didn't even know who they were and I didn't know how to reach out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, expressing your story to someone who's safe because everyone isn't always safe to say it to. It's like, Oh, well just, you know, go take a nap. And if a nap could fix it, that would be awesome. Right. That would be awesome. If getting your hair done could fix it, we would all do it. Right. Um, it's, it's when that stuff doesn't work. So saying it to someone who's safe, I think is a really big thing. I remember someone said to me and they're like, but your baby's so cute. 
And I was like, well, thank God she's not ugly because this would be really terrible if she was. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that I was sad because she wasn't cute. I was really glad she was. I just didn't know how to connect. For me, that was my biggest thing. So see, there's this overall theme and I of minimalizing. Like, go get your hair done. You need a mom's day out. You know, have your husband or boyfriend or partner stay with the baby and take an hour off. And that doesn't fix these deep feelings um they might help it might help for a little while um but at that point when as you were saying you know the term raw um when you're that raw you really need to reach out and find a safe person now what happens so i had a friend who who reached out to me and she lived in um a different state and she said that she was struggling and i thought oh you know, there's got to be a hospital with a postpartum pro a program, right? So I start Googling because of my amazing experience that I got to have with you and Central DuPage and Delnor. Um, and I Googled hospitals in, in this state that had postpartum programs and there was zero. Mm -hmm. And I thought, <laughs> this is really going to be difficult because where is she? And then I started like Googling postpartum support groups in the city that she lived in and there was none so i'm thinking oh my gosh what this person what this woman needs is support and she does she's not as lucky as i am to live five miles away from a hospital that has this program mm -hmm. so what do you say to those people that aren't able to kind of when you talk about a safe person who should they go to and 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 why are they afraid you know, maybe it's their best friend, but there's this feeling of, I can't even tell my best friend this. You know, and, and, and sometimes because that best friend will either um, not qualify it and be like, you know what, you're just tired. And maybe I am, but, it, you know, that doesn't make it any better. Um, I think um, our, our doctor staff, so per the law, the OBs have to do um, the Edinburgh or screening. some screening test at six weeks. And the pediatricians have to do it for every um, set pediatric appointment that's not an episodic appointment, meaning not a sick appointment. So they have to offer it to you. You don't have to take it, but they have to offer it to you. So um, there has been a lot of time and energy spent trying to educate um, our doctors and give them a plan. Okay. So if a person scores this, then, you know, they usually call me. Um, but if a person scores within this range or has this on this test and they have to have something in place, yeah. once they have that, then they tend to do better with it. Then they tend to, um, administer the tests. I know one practice that we just don't know what to do with it when we get the scores. So once you, once you have a policy set in place, then everybody can do it. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, there's a stigma, too, with medications. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and I say this to my ladies all the time. I said there's so much um, with where everyone is at the time. And, you know, it's education, it's support, it's referral, it's understanding, it's community. Um, and medication can be a key to that. And I always say, you know, medication to me is a bridge. It's a bridge to get you to the other side safely. Sometimes that bridge is a little bit longer and that's okay. Yeah. And, um, and many people think that medication is a crutch, which implies something's broken or wrong with you. It's not. So, you know, we all don't have to take medication, but sometimes you're going to get to that baby's first year. And with medication, there's a chance that that could be helpful and you could remember more or maybe enjoy more. Yeah. You know, um, I always say make sure to take pictures because you were present. And I think I posted this on the site not long ago because yeah. I, um, whenever I look back, I have four kids. And whenever I look back, especially uh, probably the, I don't remember, the, the fourth probably, I always feel like I have a look on my face like, eh. And I can see it. And I found a picture um, of him when he was probably about three weeks old. And I thought, you know what? I don't. I look tired, but I don't look miserable. I, I saw that picture and you mm -hmm. look beautiful. I looked tired, but I don't I don't look like and I always feel like every picture I took back then, I was always like, uh -huh. and that's what I would do in, in a video. He'd be like, hey, I'm like, hey. And when I saw that. I thought I was there and I didn't. I wasn't so miserable and there was a lot more moments. And so I'm glad that I have pictures yeah. to remember because I don't remember that picture being taken. But, um, and I did, I got all teary eyed and I'm like, I was there. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember loving him like crazy. I just, I just struggled. I struggled with, with the timing of it. There's this pressure and it's so interesting in our society. You would think it would be gone to be a perfect. Oh, it's worse now than it's but ever been. What is perfect? I mean, 
I think imperfect is more perfect than perfect because mm-hmm. you're being honest mm-hmm. with who you are. And I noticed that finally when my walls came down, people would ask me questions. And the more raw and real that I was in situations, the more I connected to other moms. Mm-hmm. When I wasn't done up, perfect looking, whatever that means. And I was like, you know, this is hard today. I'm having a rough day. Mm -hmm. Or this is me. This is what you get. I made more friends that way Mm -hmm. than trying to pretend that everything was okay. So I'm just, I'm still a little bit shocked. And I mean, I could talk about that forever. Why in this society and in this day and age, we still think that it's, this is the hardest job on earth. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't stop. I mean, my son is 10. It's getting harder at 10. My daughter is 2. That's a tornado. So it's like, (laughs) you know, the baby time is extremely difficult, but we're supposed to smooth. Like, who gave us that? Who told us that? Like, where did that come from? You know what? I don't know. It's funny because when it was probably about five years ago and um, I was up at my parents and my mom and I were sharing and I finally kind of came clean with just all the struggles I had when the kids were baby and my mom and my mom got all teary eyed. She said, I had postpartum depression, like, and, you know, we're all older now, <laughs> a lot older. And, um, and she said, I never knew it. I mm-hmm. mean, I knew that I didn't really enjoy it. And, you know, but she said that I, I had it when you describe what you just went through, I did the same thing. So I don't even know if there's kind of a stigma. Like I remember talking to you a couple of times being like, Quimby, just come to group today. Mm-hmm. Remember this? I'm like, just come to group. I don't care. Just, you know, we have valley parking right there. It's right at the end of the hospital. It doesn't matter. Just come to group. And sometimes it's just too much of an effort when you're just not like, oh, I can't do it. I always tell people, I'm like, noon's coming whether you come or not. Yeah. So sometimes it's like, oh, do I really feel like getting the diaper bag packed and get in the car? So I always say, you know, kind of push yourself to get to that point where you can just to walk in. I have some people who walk in and say, I don't want to say anything today. I just want to sit and listen. Yeah. And that's absolutely fine. You know, and then some ladies will come and be like, can I start? And I might take a while. And, um, and the ladies truly rally around that. And um, I think that just says so much for both that they came out. I mean, some moms will come in and they'll be like, do you know how long it took me to get here? And I argued with myself all the way here. Yeah. It was like the last thing I really felt I needed. But the minute I walked through that door, it's exactly what I needed. Because sometimes it's hard to sit there and say, yes, I don't, I'm not enjoying this, or I'm struggling with this part of parenthood, or I'm struggling feeling like this. And, um, and I love it that they share. I mean, the moms make up that group, period. I mean, you know, the, yeah. the support and stuff in which people can really reach out. So once you have that type of connection, it's so great, because then like you look at you're still two years later, you're still, you know, um, pushing it forward and, mm-hmm. you know, and helping the other moms. I'll never forget mm-hmm. them either. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, I think there are things that you forget when you have a baby. You forget all of those moments because you're so tired and you're so worn down. But I will never forget those moments with those women mm-hmm. and who they are mm-hmm. um, because they really helped me through. Mm hmm. So, um, and think of people you helped through. I think sometimes, I think sometimes you forget that, that your story and your kind face and your smile and a hug or touching someone's shoulder when they're, when they were raw. So that helps them. And that's healing for us as well, even if you didn't say a word. Right. So I think, I think you had a real strong force, um, when you came. And I think that was, you were so eloquent when you spoke and, um, and you were so, um, your words came so easily with your struggles where it doesn't always for people. And, um, and I think pe- you could see people nodding when you were talking. Yeah. <laughs> right. I do. I do remember mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, I guess a question, um, that I have an answer to, but I'd like to know what your answer is first. Um, if, what would you like to see change regarding postpartum depression and the way society looks at it and the way that we approach it. You know what? I, um, I really would like to see, um, starting in the hospital, we do have the screening in place, which we've started a couple of years ago. So before you go on with the screening, mm-hmm. um, I think that the issue right there is that women are going to be afraid. So how do we get them not to be afraid to admit Right. Because that screening test always looks a little bit intimidating. Yeah, I can see that. And we want to kind of fib on it. Right. Like, okay, five is the worst. (laughs) So how do we 
I think that's more maybe for the medical community is to be more compassionate in their approach. But I mean, I don't know. Um, but how do we, I wish more people would be able to listen to this podcast and they probably will, because it's really like, don't be afraid to be honest and to be real. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and I think like during the prenatal classes, I know we talk about it. Um, and one thing you said, and I didn't touch on, um, was the fact that people are afraid that somebody is going to start looking at them or looking into them as a parent if they don't, you know, if if they come in and they maybe say how they're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think knowing what postpartum depression is, it's very different from from a, from a mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a situational um, format, and I think that's a big deal because I do think I. I just thinking about one one woman now, and she came in and she said, "I'm just afraid that you're going to call DCFS and take away my baby." If I tell you how I really feel, mm-hmm. there's that huge fear out huge. there. Huge, and so when she did, and I said no, and um, you know, part of it is you know, there's d- different kinds of perinatal mood disorders, and um, there's postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum OCD, which is kind of a reoccurring thought, um, and that's an anxiety thought, and um, sometimes you know how do I say this? Sometimes, you know, it's maybe involves the baby and then they get anxiety. And so I said, how do you feel when you have those thoughts? And she's like, I feel terrible. I'm like, that's perfect. That's your anxiety. talking. Yes, That's your anxiety talking. That's how you're doing anxiety. Um, I forget how Leslie said it. It's just, it's a big imposter because it makes you believe things about yourself that aren't true. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that was one thing that I said, that's great. If, you know, if you're having these thoughts and there's no anxiety and it just seems like a normal part of a day, that's when, that's when, you know, some intervention and the intervention is not to separate you and the baby. Right. The intervention is, is to get you more help than, than a support group like myself and, you know, get you in, in, you know, I mean, have, make sure your family's involved, take, separate you and the baby is my, it's just never even an option for me. So I think that's women's fear when they read that screening. Mm-hmm. So how do we change that? How do we, what do you think? You know, unfortunately do? the screening, there's only two screenings that we do and they're all, they're all evidence-based screenings. So, um, there's only two that we do because they're evidence-based and, um, and just really just education, you know, mm-hmm. um, when a celebrity has postpartum depression and they talk about it, I like, think that's awesome. I do too. <laughs> and, and I know, and you know, it's like, oh, well they can talk about it. They had all this help, but they're coming out. Like I just keep thinking of Brooke Shields and she has her book. I don't know if you've read her book, mm-hmm. Down Came the Rain. Very, very good book. Very powerful. Um, and then I think it makes it so that it becomes so normal that she'll sit on a talk show and talk about it that she you know couldn't get out of pajamas and 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 the and the how she felt that deep that deep just pain that she felt and um Marie Osmond, she was a real big one. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's great. So remembering that that's just the everyday person. You know, mm-hmm. they do. They have so many advantages that maybe some of us don't. I didn't protect them, now did it? No. So it's just, it's so much internal and getting support. I could never have gotten through it um, without my husband. He was very supportive. He was very understanding. And I remember with the third baby, she was 19 days old and in the morning, he'd look at me kind of out of the corner of his eye. He's like, how are you feeling today? <laughs> no, literally. And I'm like, I would kind of look around I'm like, nah, I, I think I skipped it this time. He's like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I got it. That came crashing with the pregnancy with my fourth. And I'm not prone to depression or anxiety. So, but, um, but he would look at me every day like, okay, is today the day that, you know, it's kind of settling in? How you feeling? He checked in with me every day. Mm-hmm. And he again, called, yeah. yeah, you're saying it's situational. So some people think... This is me. This is my new me. This is who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And it's a situational. Absolutely. And perhaps it could morph if you don't get it, get the proper help or whatever. But I think if you reach out and and kind of look for strongholds, you will you will pull through it. For me, I think it was um, mourning the loss of the experience I was going to be as a mother, mm-hmm. which was the perfect mother. Right. <laughs> Nothing. You know, my baby was never going to cry. And I think in mourning my old, mourning my old life, like you can't just pick up. And I remember I said one time, I'm like, I remember two weeks ago, I couldn't go to a movie because I was too busy. What exactly was I busy doing? Like I just, you know, because it takes over, but it's such a, you know, once the baby starts getting a little bit sturdier and has some, and has some reaction to you and starts to smile, that's when I felt better. Yeah. And, you know, got a little sturdier and then you get some feedback and then. 
I really enjoyed that part of it. And then I could see, I could see some give and take there and you start to get some sleep. Sleep is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Sleep is a really big thing. So, you know, having some understanding, you know, paying attention to your signs and symptoms, including your family and the safe family members, you know, by the way, like this is what to look for. I remember one of my moms, she was in our, um, our prenatal class, our childbirth basics class. And um, when the instructor was going over postpartum depression and perinatal mood disorders, she said, oh, that's not going to be me. I'm just mm-hmm. so pleased. And I just couldn't wait to have this baby. And she came in and she was clutching the pamphlet when she came in to see me. She said, my husband put this in my hand today and said, you have to go to the hospital. You have to go to that group because something's wrong. Not something's wrong with you, but just something's wrong. And maybe someone can help you figure it out. I thought that was such a great, great thing to say. Yeah. Because it wasn't wrong with her. And she said, I was so surprised. So when you say, how are we going to prevent that? She sat there and listened to that and was like, there is no way. That's how I thought. That's how I thought. Oh, I was going to rock motherhood. Yeah. I rock thought, it. I thought, why are you in my room? Why are you here talking to me about postpartum depression? That's not me. And you know what? You do rock motherhood. And you you have from the, from the get-go. Well, I agree with you on the statements about the best mothers walk through that door. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think it takes a very courageous person to reach out for help. Um, And so I guess um, to those that are listening, um, because we only have a couple more minutes here, um, any messages of encouragement to them? You know, I think um, motherhood, I mean, we, we can't understand motherhood until we're there. It's like learning how to swim from a book, but then someone throws you in an ocean. So we doggy paddle and we find the closest person that's safe. And I think that is something to understand that we're not going to get it all and to make sure to rely on family, rely on hospital. We have, you know, we have three different support groups each week. Um, And, you know, that have to do with if you decide to breastfeed, that have to do with postpartum connection and then baby connection, our baby play group. And they're all facilitated by an RN. So staying connected with that, I think that is one of the best things because the connection part of it from mom to mom is truly understanding, you know, because they've been there in some level. And I think, um, and I think that's great. And I do, I think the best mamas walk through that door. And whenever I see a new mama walk through my door and I always say, how did you find us? Like, and I'm always so glad. And she's like, well, my doctor, or she saw it in the hospital, but I'm still amazed that they drive and they park and they come into a room that's so safe and they don't even understand how, welcoming that first step the is, tribe you know they yeah, yeah yeah that first step through the door really mm-hmm. is the first step so thank you i'm glad that you are my first guest on this show because you really set the course for me and had i not reached out and had i not found you i don't think we'd be sitting in these chairs doing what we're doing right now so i just want to thank you and well quimby um, it was a pleasure from being part of your process with the end of the pregnancy with your first daughter and mm-hmm. watching you grow as a mother of two you know mm-hmm. grow in you know in your relationship with dave and grow in in a spiritual leader in a leader for the um for the ladies and for your own family so yeah. i'm just i'm so proud of you yeah i think you've done so well and doing something like this is incredible and this does reach people i'm proud of you too thank you so thank you so much and then how can they find you so if anyone wants to find find you, how do they? If you, um, Postpartum Support International, which is um, postpartum.net, that is the, um, that's our U.S. postpartum support group. Mm-hmm. And all of all of the support groups um, in the United States are on there. Um, postpartum Illinois um, Alliance is on there. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just at, at Central DuPage Hospital. Right. If you just call that, then... They, um, that goes directly They'll find to my phone. the mm-hmm. local group. But if yeah, they, Stephanie if, Krantz, yeah. If anybody broad spectrum, go to Postpartum Support Inter- International. Yeah, and then they, they can find anything. But I've had people reach over from all over the country. Okay. So they don't have to deliver at CDA Tradelner to come to come to our group. So Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Quinby, that was a really good interview. Thanks, Jaime. This is that was your first time hosting a podcast. This is the first ever episode hosting a podcast. So yes, uh, I'm already looking forward to the next one. I am too. You got any um, credits you want to roll here at the end? Any thank yous? Um, definitely thank you to Stephanie, obviously for everything that she represents and that she stands for, and obviously thank you to you, oh. Mr. Jaime. Well, it's my pleasure. Gutierrez for producing this, hosting us. Yeah. Um, in your 
fabulous studio. So thank you. Well, thank you um, for being such a, a wonderful host. I, did, I barely had to give you any coaching or, or tips or anything. I think you're a natural. I'm... I... <laughs> you like talking, I think. <laughs> I just think that... You're a talker. I think that I and the people that I have lined up have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. So there's just so much that, that needs to be out there in the community that I guess I'm willing to, I'm willing to represent and, and share if I can. So... All right. Thank I think, you. I think we should do another one. We're going to do another one. We've All got right. a list already. Everybody so. keep their eyes open. You can follow us at uh, Fox Valley Voice on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, foxvalleyvoice.com to listen to uh, these episodes. And we've got several other shows on our network as well. If you enjoyed this one, you want to promote any of your, your personal websites or anything like that? I mean, they can... You can find me on Instagram and you can find me on Facebook, but... Quigley. <laughs> Quen v. Skyler, don't even start. <laughs> Figure it out. Like, there's like three Quen v's in the world, so I'm one of them. Uh, there's but, only um, one. There's I, only one in my book. I did forget to say thank you to those who took the time to listen. Um, well, of course. So, very appreciative. And if, and if you... Uh, know somebody, especially this ep episode specific, that needs encouragement, please feel free to share. And we'd love always to hear feedback. So, Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, Quindy. Fox Valley Voice.